Greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Andreas Benokratis. I'm a product manager for Ansible Network Automation, and I will be your MC for today. Today's Ansible Network Automation webinar is being hosted by Ratul Mahajan and Samir Parikh and is titled Validating Pre-Commit Network Configuration Changes at Scale with Batfish and Ansible. Ratul is the CEO and co-founder of IntentionNet, and Samir is the product owner of Batfish uh, and maybe some other products, they'll go through that. And they will go through the fascinating world of pre-commit network change validation, um, as well as uh, Ansible integration. Uh, so before we begin, I wanna make sure we go over a few housekeeping items. All participants will be on mute for the duration of the webinar. So if you have any questions during this presentation, we ask that you use the questions uh, feature in the webinar app on the right. So if you look on the right, you will see a little tab, a little uh, twisty that says questions. Feel free to use that if you have any questions because you will be on mute. Ask your question there. If there's any time at the end of the webinar, we will address as many questions as possible. Uh, for some of the easier questions, we'll, we'll post those in the questions app as well and so that everyone can see it. Last but not least, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the training and webinars section of ansible.com uh, by next week, possibly this week if we have some time. So uh, keep your eyes open. If you wanna see the replay for this and send it to your friends, friends and family, uh, that'll be by the end of the week. So appreciate you all being here and without further ado, let's kick things off. Um, before we actually get to the, the meet with uh, IntentionNet, I uh, wanted to give you a couple of quick announcements from the Ansible side. We actually have a few, a few events we wanted to, to plug and share with you. Uh, Ansible Automates, the global tour is well underway. Uh, we've done some already here in the US. We're moving into uh, the into Europe as well. So for the next couple here, we have uh, Ansible Automates, which is a free one day uh, open open event, which is if you've been to, if you've heard of Ansible Fest, this is more of like a taste of Ansible Fest, is what we call Automates. It's great for beginners or first timers to Ansible. Um, getting started, we actually talk about networking. There's a we talk about security and networking and Windows and Linux and everything there. So pretty much a little bit everything as part of the Automates tour. Um, so we have Oslo, Tampa, Moscow, Stockholm, Johannesburg, and Antwerp. And we actually also have New York City, which I did not put on here, which is also on December 4th. So if you're interested to hear more about what Ansible can do and you're new, uh, feel free to just register on the ansible.com slash automates uh, site and we get registered to, uh, to attend for free. Next slide. Last plug here, we have workshops. So you may have known that we actually have Ansible workshops. These are hands-on labs uh, that are in your hometown, hopefully. Um, and this is mostly in the US right now. We hope to make this more available uh, worldwide. These actually listed our, our networking workshops. So we're actually talking about um, switching and routing automation in Portland, Houston, Rochester, Seattle, Sunnyvale, and Charleston. So. I know uh, Portland was yesterday, Houston's today, um, Rochester uh, is today. So Seattle, Sunnyvale, Charleston, and more to come will be in hopefully in your neck of the woods. So take a look at the website, ansible.com slash workshops, if you want to see networking workshops or the more generic general Linux workshops. Uh, with that, next slide. And I'll hand it over to our team from IntentionNet. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Andreas. Welcome, everybody. You know, we're excited to be here with you guys on this webinar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we want to talk about, uh, we're going to cover a lot of topics today uh, at a high level. We're going to talk about the state of network validation today. We're going to cover in detail what we call comprehensive pre-commit validation using Batfish and Ansible. And then we're going to demo Ansible plus Batfish in action. And we've got plenty of time for Q&A, so uh, please keep your questions coming throughout the session, and we'll cover them at the end. So real quick, who, who are we? So Intentionet, we're a company based in Seattle, Washington. We were founded in 2015, and we have our funding from the National Science Foundation and True Ventures. And our mission is to enable organizations to build networks with security and reliability guarantees. And there's a specific emphasis on these guarantees where we wanna help you have provable guarantees. So our mission is to make you, help you prove that your network is secure and reliable along with guaranteeing that it is secure and reliable. 
So what are we building? So in order to achieve that mission, we are building a comprehensive network validation solution called Batfish. Uh, now, Batfish today is an open source project. It's open sourced under the Apache 2 license. Uh, we've got a growing user community, including multiple Fortune 500 companies. And we have a growing developer community from developers at IntentionNet, ourselves, Princeton, BBN, Microsoft, and others. So why are we building it? You know, we see this amazing trend in networking around automation. And network automation enables you to scale, it enables consistency, and it provides great speed and operation. But the one thing missing piece in network automation is it doesn't guarantee correctness. You know, a single typo can bring down your entire network. So I found this quote online the other day, uh, to err is to human, to propagate errors massively at scale requires automation. Effective change validation is so crucial in any automated workflow. Uh, so let's talk about what makes change validation effective. We see two broad attributes of effective change validation. One is that it is proactive, meaning you can perform it before deployment of any change to the network and it happens automatically and continuously. The second is it's comprehensive. It, and by that I mean it meets production scale and it covers all possible flows, failures, and routes. So let's talk about some of the validation methods that we have in use today. A very common validation technique we see is text analysis. So what this lets you do is it lets you check for the presence of specific configuration attributes. You know, is an NTP server set? Is it set to a specific value? Is a DNS server set? Do you have AAA properly configured? And it's very easy to do this pre-deployment, but the one downfall is it's not comprehensive. And the reason it's not comprehensive is because it's not validating any specific network behavior. It's simply checking for specific text in your configuration file. And because every vendor language is different, the text analysis tools are vendor specific and also very brittle because they rely on regular expressions. And the hope is that the vendors aren't changing their config syntax often. The other common method that we see is emulation. So emulation, historically, people have done this with physical labs. More and more equipment vendors are releasing VMs or containers of their images. So now we can actually virtualize these emulation pl platforms. But what emulation allows you to do is you can check very specific network behaviors. For instance, are all your BGP sessions up in your emulated environment? Can my test client reach the DNS server in the emulated environment? And then you can play around with different link failures, saying, I've got redundancy. Let me fail this link and see what happens. And make sure that all these other attributes still hold true. And of course, you can do this all in pre before you deploy the config by, but it's not comprehensive. The biggest challenge in an emulation environment is it's not production scale, because let's face it, no one has the budget or the time to build an exact replica of their production network. Uh, and also even in the virtual domain, it's just not possible to sort of create the scale of your production environment. And the other challenge you have is it's really not feasible to test all possible flows all possible failures or route updates, because the space of all possible flows is so large. The third thing we see is operational state analysis. So what this is, is checking specific attributes of the operational network, specific states. So are all my BGP sessions currently up in the network? Can my client reach the DNS server? Or if I was to do a trace route from client X to server Y, is that going to succeed? So here, think of it as part of it is very akin to monitoring. You're probing the network for very specific operational states. Now, by definition, since you're probing the, op the operational state of the network, this is not something you can do pre-deployment. This is always a post-deployment validation, which is still important, but obviously doesn't meet our requirements. And it's not comprehensive because, let's face it, no one wants you to test possible failures or possible route updates in your production environment because you don't know what's going to happen. And again, you can't really feasibly test all possible flows in this environment. So while it's very useful and important, 
it doesn't meet the two key requirements for effective change validation, which is it must be pre-deployment and it must be comprehensive. So none of the techniques we've seen here meet those requirements. And so we need a new approach. And that new approach is model-based validation. So what I want to talk about analysis. So what model-based analysis allows me to do is it allows me to check all possible network behaviors. It allows me to check if any flow can go from one subnet to, uh, to another. So can I cross isolation boundaries? It helps me check that all clients can reach the DNS server, not just a specific client or a subset of them. And I can test if any link failure will cause a service disruption for any of my applications. On top of that, I can do all of this pre-deployment because I can do this just based on the configurations of all the network devices. And it's comprehensive because I can do this at production scale. And like I said, I can test all possible failures, all possible route announcements, all possible uh, uh, flows. And so Batfish, the solution we've built, is an example of a model-based validation tool. So let me tell you more about how Batfish works. So to get started with Batfish, all you have to do is feed it the configuration of all your network devices. Now, we support all the popular network vendors, very common question that we get, whether it's Cisco, Arista, Juniper, the cloud providers, and the list is growing every day. So you feed these network configurations, and then on the back of that, we build a set of models. The first model we build is a vendor neutral configuration model. So we normalize the vendor syntax into a common data model that we use to provide all the analysis capabilities of Batfish. On the back of that, we create a routing model. So we do a full route simulation and we build the ribs and fibs of the network that would be generated by those specific configurations. And the third thing is we build a mathematical model of, network, of the network behavior. So we turn these first two models into a set of equations. And this is the key for providing that comprehensive network validation that I talked about. This is the thing that allows us to check all possible packets, all possible link failures, all possible route announcements. So these network models coupled with our analysis engine and your network policy is what allows us to provide this validation. And so when you run a candidate configuration change through Batfish, what you're gonna get in the end is a list of certifications. So the set of policies that are passing and then a set of violations. So very specific details around each policy that is being violated and why it's being violated. So let me talk a bit, a bit about network policies. So in Batfish, the network policies are specific network behaviors that you wanna make sure always hold true. We typically see three broad categories of policies. We see security policies, reliability policies, and compliance policies. So let's take security policies. Security policy could be that no traffic must pass between sub subnet A and subnet B, or all traffic between my branch offices must be encrypted because I'm, going, I'm connecting them over the internet, or no route advertisement or announcement should disrupt any of my internal traffic. A set of reliability policies might look like no single link failure should cause an outage for any of my services. Uh, I think our GitHub friends would have really liked to be able to have had this check in place before their maintenance window uh, two weeks ago. Uh, other checks would be, I've got my data center fabric and I wanna make sure that all my leafs have complete reachability, that I have all leaf to leaf reachability, or I wanna guarantee that no matter what the change is, that my DNS servers are always globally accessible inside and outside my network. And a compliance policy might look something like, all my devices must only be accessed via secure communication methods, so SSL, SSH, SCP. You might have a set of site standards that everything in, in my data center in London must use this NTP server, must have these SNMP settings, et cetera. And then you also might have a policy that says, I should have no undefined references on any of my device configurations. All of these policies are things that Batfish can evaluate. And when it does that policy evaluation, 
it guarantees the correctness of that of your configuration of your network for all possible packets, all possible link failures, and all possible route announcements. So how do you use Batfish in, the, in its policy framework? So there's a couple of different ways you can envision leveraging Batfish in your network. The first and most obvious one is as part of a network CI/CD pipeline. So because Batfish is pre-deployment and comprehensive, you can use that to build your pre-deployment validation. But you can also plumb it into post-deployment post validation and provide that continuous validation that you need in your CI/CD pipeline. But it's not just relegated to this automated pipeline. You can also use it to test very specific network scenarios. You've got a disaster recovery plan. You've built out infrastructure. Use Batfish to test if the disaster recovery plan is actually going to hold true. So that if that disaster occurs, will the network fail over correctly? Will your services still be accessible on the, in the DR site, et cetera? Or more routine stuff that we've seen people do all the time is you've got a maintenance window. You've defined your mop. Before you go into the maintenance window and execute your mop, test it out in Batfish to make sure that no step in that mop is going to create an outage even in the maintenance window. So helps you really shrink down on the time of the maintenance window and reduces the odds that you will have an error uh, post maintenance. So what I want to talk about today is this very specific sort of first use case in that CID CD pipeline, which is pre-deployment change validation. Talk about that with Ansible and Batfish. So this is just sort of a a sample workflow that you might use. You want to make a change. You've got a set of Ansible playbooks that you use to make that change. The Ansible playbook is going to use your predefined Jinja templates to generate configs. Those configs all go into your source control. And then as soon as the configs are generated, you kick off your validation test with Batfish. And now here, Batfish is going to pull all the latest configs that you want to evaluate and run the predefined network policies against that. And if there's any failures, you're going to get a notification back saying these specific policies failed and why. And that gives you enough information to sort of start that process over. And then you go back and you offer the change again. And you do this until Batfish finally tells you that all my policies have passed. Now, at this point, either manually or hopefully automatically using another playbook, you would deploy that to production. But now you know you have proof through the Batfish uh, results that that change is safe to deploy in production, that's going to meet all your requirements, it's not going to create an outage, it's not going to open a security hole. So with that, let's jump into the demo. Let's see Batfish in action. So I'm going to kick off my Ansible playbook. Actually, let me go back. Let me explain the scenarios first. So the what I'm going to show you is two scenarios off this base demo network. The first one is I'm going to expand my data center fabric by adding a new leaf. And then on that new leaf, I'm going to enable a new set of services. And so I'm going to update my firewalls and change the whitelist policy on those firewalls. So the first example is going to expand my data center fabric by adding this new leaf, LHR leaf 03 to pod one. And then I'm Connected to that is going to be a host subnet 10.1.5.0 slash 24. So before I kick off the playbook, here's sort of the pipeline that you can expect to see. I'm going to have some minimal user input, pretty common in any automated config generation. I'm going to generate those configs using my predefined Jinja templates. I'm going to commit those changes to a Git branch. I'm going to automatically initiate change validation with Batfish. And specifically, I'm going to evaluate two macro policies. I have a what I call a data center base policy, which is about specific attributes that must hold true for all network devices. Like all my routers in that data center must use the TACX server 1.2.3.4. They must all use the NTP servers 1.2.3.4 or 1.2.3.5. And they should have no undefined references, no unused structures. And all my ACLs or filters on any device should have no unreachable lines. So this is my data center base policy. But I also have a fabric policy that I want to validate since I'm making a change to the data center fabric. And that policy wants to ensure that all my BGP sessions are compatible. 
but beyond being compatible, that they're all going to be established. And that once established, all my host subnets on all the leaf routers can reach all the other host subnets on all the other leaf routers. So all to all leaf reachability. And because of my design, I need to make sure that all my leaf routers use a unique BGP AS number because that's part of my BGP design. So as soon as I kick off that validation, as soon as it's done, my playbook's going to log the results into S3, and then I'm going to get a notification via Slack. So let's see this playbook in action. And when I build playbooks, I like to use a lot of tags so that it gives me the ability to test each individual component uh, as I'm developing. So that's why you see these various tags. So I'm going to provide my basic input. The new leaf I want to add is LHR leaf 03. Within my data center, I'm specifically adding it to pod number one. And then I need to give it my BGP AS number. And then I'm off to the races. So while this is running, let me show you the playbook. So my master playbook is very simple. I'm importing very specific playbooks underneath it to do the different tasks that I outlined in that pipeline. Think of it as a way to provide various gates in your automation workflow. I have a playbook that's sort of adding my leaf, a playbook that's creating the candidate snapshot. I'm uploading it to Git. I'm validating it, generating my logs, uploading my logs to S3, and then I'm notifying, uh, getting a notification via Slack. So if I look at my validation playbook, uh, it's a pretty simple playbook. We've, we're, we've created a set of Ansible modules for Batfish. And so all I'm doing in this playbook is calling into that, that Batfish Ansible module, telling it, hey, this is my network. And this is the new candidate configuration set that I want to evaluate. Please run all my policies, register the results, and then uh, export them once you're done. So at this point, I should have been completed. Oh, crap. Stuff does not exist. And there we go. So we've gone through and we've successfully initialized the configurations and the snapshots. And you can see we sort of each of these tasks that are being executed is exactly as we had in the pipeline. So we pushed the change to Git. We called our play to validate the snapshot. We're analyzing that candidate and we're generating the results. And now we're updating the logs to S3. And we have a Slack message. So if I look at my Slack channel, I see the notification. The result failed. Let me bring up those the errors real quick. So this is the log that gets generated. I can see that my data center base policy, all the checks passed. But in my data center fabric policy, I have two failures. The first one, which is all leaf routers have a unique BGP ASN, and then all leaf to leaf reachability. So if I look at the first failure, I can see exactly what happened. I reused ASN 65002. It was already in use on leaf two. Uh, so I, my input was incorrect. So, uh, and that's exactly the reason why the second check failed. So now I'm just going to go ahead and fix that and rerun things. I give it 6503. Hopefully this time that is the correct AS number, but the beauty of Batfish is we'll find out very shortly if that is exact is a available AS number for me to use. So you can see we're committing the new changes into Git, kicking off the validation job again, and everything passed. So get another Slack notification. I 
everything passed. We can also obviously check the logs and the logs also concur. All of my checks have passed. So I know this change is now safe and I could push this to my network. At this point, whatever your workflow is, you can either have a hook in the Ansible playbook that automatically pushes it, or you could have the log be the key that tells somebody. To... So that's the first scenario. So now that we have this new leaf, so let's recap what we have in that, what we did in that scenario. So Batfish was automatically able to determine that that AS input for the first candidate change was incorrect. Now, in a running network or in your lab environment, this would be a pretty hard thing to find because if you looked at the other checks, all the BGP sessions were compatible and all the BGP sessions were up. Therefore, all the routes would have been present on the spine routers. And so it'd been very hard to troubleshoot exactly why hosts behind one leaf to the other leaf couldn't communicate. And then the other part that's sort of important is when we made the change and we did the second candidate evaluation, Batfish returned no errors. And so that is the proof that you need that the change is correct and safe. So now you can go ahead and either automatically or manually commit that change into your network and be sure that it's not going to create any outages and it's going to have the desired impact. So now that we've added this leaf into the data center, let's take the next step, which is, hey, I want to enable these web servers behind this leaf uh, to communicate with the outside world. So what that means is I'm going to allow any uh, IP address, so 0 slash 0, to reach my web servers running on TCP port 80 in part of my network on leaf 3 in subnet 10.1.5.0 slash 27. And so similar user flow to the first scenario, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to update, I'm going to provide my target list to firewalls. I'm going to update my firewall policy. I'm going to make my firewall change spec. And then that's going to trigger the generation of configs, commit to the Git branch, and I'm going to initiate my change validation with Batfish. Now, the one difference here is because I'm making a very targeted change for the first time, I'm actually going to create a change specific test where I want to validate that this change has the desired impact. And in the case of an ACL or firewall change, there's three checks that matter to me. I want to make sure that, A, the change is necessary. So I have the change spec that is desired. Let's make sure that the config doesn't already meet that. Then obviously, I want to make sure the change that I'm about to make is going to meet that change spec. So it's going to allow those web servers to be accessible from outside my network. And third, and probably one of the more important checks is, I want to make sure there's no collateral damage. I want to make sure that the only change is the change that matches that exact specification, that only the desired servers are accessible from outside my network, nothing else. And I also want to make sure that I'm also not inadvertently denying traffic for any other service that's already running. And so once my change specific test is validated, I also want to make sure that all my base policies for my network that I just ran through still hold true. And only after that will I go ahead and commit the change. And so once I run through these policies, we'll see the results and we'll get notified by Slack. So the first thing I need to do as part of my input is I actually need to change the ACL that I want to, to run on the firewalls. So I have my ACL definition in my source of truth uh, to sort of prevent myself from having any typos. I've got my change written out. So now, I've updated the source of truth for my ACL definition for my firewall, and so now I can run my playbook. So now I'm going to run. I have a separate playbook here because the workflow is slightly different that uses all the same components as I did before. So I'm going to tell it which firewalls I want to update. Same pod, and now the chain spec that I showed earlier, I want to allow any, IP, any source to my web servers. With TCP port 80. And now I've gone ahead and that's going to kick off the generation of both firewall configs from the templates. And then as soon as that's done, the rest of the process is going to happen. Configuration will get loaded into Git, 
and then Batfish will evaluate the changes. So there we go. We've now checked out our branch in Git from Git, copying our changes. Gone through and now evaluating our ACL specific, our chain specific tests. And you can see here we have a failure. And now let's look at the details from the failure log. So go back to my Slack window. I see my latest changes failed. When I look into it, I can see the first two checks out of my cha ACL specific change validation have passed. So the traffic that I wanted to permit was not already permitted, so that's good. The change that I proposed actually permits the traffic I wanted to permit, so that's good. So I got the first two right. But I did not pass the no collateral damage check probably the most important of these three checks. Uh, and when I look at that, the results I'm getting, basically what I'm seeing here is this line that I added, which is permit TCP any port 80 with, to this destination subnet with that wildcard mask, is permitting more flows than the change spec. And that's because for any of the flows that are outside of the change spec, they were previously being denied, but they are now being permitted. And what Batfish is going to tell me along with that is it's going to give me an example flow. So it tells me, by the way, just to give you more context, this source destination IP is one that is should have not have been permitted, but is now being permitted. So now with that information, I need to go back and look at my ACL line. So it turns out I did the subnet math, mask math wrong. So when I wanted to permit a slash 27, uh, I should have given it a mask of a wildcard mask of dot 31 instead of dot 63. So I'm going to save that and I'm going to try this thing again. So let's run through the exact same playbook. So make sure I get both of my firewalls. Maybe, and I'm up and running. And so while this is running, you know, another common way this sort of this workflow would kick off would be could be through our ServiceNow ticket. So we see a lot of use cases where an app developer will raise a request in ServiceNow saying, "Hey, my new web app is ready. The compute cluster is ready. I need you to open this these flows in the firewall. So now my service is accessible." So just like I provided that change spec as input through the command line, this very easily could have just been pushed to the Ansible playbook via that ServiceNow ticket. And so we've gone through and we've run through all the same uh, steps. We've created the configs, now we're validating. So here you see the ACL validation play is kicked off. That passed, and so now it's going through and it's going to change, validate my general network policies. And it looks like that change was correct, so everything's passed. But just to be sure, we'll wait for that Slack notification. Yep, everything's green. I can tell it's in the log. And it's going to tell me my change specific, my ACL validation test passed. And once that passed, we ran the other base policies for the network, they all passed, and so now I'm good to go. So let's recap what we just walked through in this scenario. So using Batfish, we were able to automatically determine that the firewall change that I made the first time was incorrect. And the interesting thing is this error would have been very difficult, extremely difficult to find in even in lab environment, let alone production. Because if you think about it, the change was partially correct. I needed to enable access to a set of web servers from outside my network, and that first ACL change did that. But obviously, the issue was that it opened up a bigger hole in my network than I needed to for just for those services. And 
you would sort of find this in lab or production mostly by luck, by in your test scenario, if you crafted the exact correct set of packets and flows, you would have potentially found that through your, through your tests. And, uh, and it requires you also to have very specific negative test cases, not just affirmative ones. And as everybody that's sort of written test plans and test cases, you know, you immediately first think about how do I validate that my code is correct? And then you sort of think about, okay, what are all the negative ways that this change could, this code could fail? And then you start writing those, and those tend to never be as complete or comprehensive as the affirmative ones. And then obviously the important point is when I looked at that second change, Batfish returned no errors. So once again, that is the proof you need that this change is correct and safe. So in, an, in a workflow, whether it's automatic or manual, once you see that from Batfish, that log will tell you now it's safe to go deploy this change in your environment. So before we open up to questions, just want to summarize what we talked about today. So, you know, automation is extremely important and an extremely important part of the network engineering discipline, but without effective validation, it's very risky. And Batfish is that tool that can provide that comprehensive pre-deployment validation to complete your automation pipeline. Because with Batfish, you can ensure that your network is always secure, reliable, and compliant. And hopefully you've seen through these demos that it's very easy to embed Batfish into your automation pipeline. We spent a lot of time, we've built a lot of resources to help you get started with Batfish. Please check out these, our Jupyter Notebooks, our YouTube videos. And as always, find us on Slack. We're happy to answer any questions and help you go down this journey of integrating Batfish and providing validation as part of your network automation workflow. So with that, I wanna thank you guys again for joining us uh, and let's open it up for questions. Great, thanks Samir, appreciate that. We do have some questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, does Batfish have a webhook I could call on a git commit? <clears throat> Yeah, so today, uh, Batfish has a REST API, so you, you can easily use a webhook to, from a git commit to trigger the Batfish validation. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, would, would Ansible Tower be a good integration as well for repetitive uh, things on schedules or whatnot? Have you, is that a, that sounds like that's, that's probably a, a softball, but I think the answer is yes there. Yeah, ab absolutely. Just like, you know, hopefully you saw that in that master playbook, we inherited multiple individual playbooks and created this gated pipeline. So, you know, we've seen Tower being very effectively used to create that gated workflow where you have a series of playbooks that you call for a given uh, job and that the execution depends on the results of the previous one. And so you create this, uh, this gated workflow. So just like we did it from the CLI, you could easily do this from Tower. Okay, great. Um, next question is in your in your second demo in scenario two, how are the firewall policies actually defined? Um, and what what I mean is, what is the input that Batfish gets to check for something like there's no collateral damage check? Um, how does it know what it means? Um, I'm guessing it is a playbook that translates to Batfish queries questions. Uh, that that's a great question. So the way that workflow works is so Batfish is always operating on network configuration. So the firewall policy itself is encoded in the configuration of the firewall. What Batfish is doing needs along with that is that change spec. So those parameters that I input on the command line, which is what are the sources that should be allowed to access the servers? Where do the servers sit? Like what's the IP address and subnet? What specific ports are open? So Batfish will take the network configurations and take that change spec and then evaluate those. And you're correct. The way that happens is there's a specific Batfish module, uh, either through our Python APIs or the Ansible module that we have in this workflow that, is, that evaluates those changes. Okay, yeah, good question. Uh, next question is, uh, does Batfish support the validation of reachability? So connectivity, right? Going from node A to node B, like in a data center environment, is, is Batfish a good use case for that? 
Uh, absolutely. You know, one of the first checks that we had in that data center fabric policy was this notion of all leaf to all leaf reachability. So Batfish is the perfect tool to help you figure out, you know, if you have global, if you have a requirement for global reachability in a data center, it can make sure that all sources and destina destinations can talk to each other. But you can also, on the other hand, restrict access. So if you have specific isolation requirements in your data center, like you're running a multi tenant data center and you have to segment tenants, you can use Batfish to guarantee that there's no traffic leakage between tenant A and tenant B. Okay, great. So um, how, uh, how, how is platform support handled? There are, there are some platforms, some people are looking for that. They're in the list of competitive places you support. Um, there's there's a, someone looking for Nokia routers, for example. How would, how would someone want to get other devices set up there? So we are always excited to work with customers to add new device support into Batfish. So the way we've built the solution is to make it very easy and modular so that we can easily add new devices. So the reason we create that vendor neutral config model and use that as the basis for analysis is that it becomes easy for us to, once we build parsers for new network devices and new vendors, all the analysis capabilities are, are available for that new platform. So uh, we're not doing vendor specific work for these analysis modules. I think the, uh, the other quick, uh, by the way, this is Ratul here. The other quick thing I'd add to that is, um, I think all of this code is open source. We've had contributions where people have added vendors based on examples that exist and we always welcome them and we basically welcome PRs. So if there's something not supported, we are happy to um, um, help you add that as well. Great, we got lots of questions, this is great. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, some some folks aren't using Ansible yet for automation, but they'd like to. Um, given this, uh, can Batfish help get people to start using Ansible? I, I I think absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we talk about, you know, that's missing in an automation pipeline is validation. So you know, by having the ability to integrate a service like Batfish into your automation workflow it becomes very easy to sort of now justify using, building out your automated workflow, picking a platform to do it. Uh, and again, we have a pretty rich Python API. Uh, and so we're using that as the basis to build these Python, mo these Ansible modules. And we already see a number of customers doing it today, right? So they're, they're either using these Ansible modules that we've just built or writing their own Python wrappers to call from an Ansible playbook to interact with the Batfish service. Right, and I think it's it's easy to say if if you need help with something, you know, both uh, Ansible and Intentionet have have enterprise products, right? Uh, that that can build on the open source projects. So if you need help with anything, um, I, I would I would say please reach out to your uh, Red Hat sales rep or reach out to Intentionet directly, and, and we can we can help you there. Next yeah, question. Um, next question is: We basically go from network models to vendor config and back to Batfish models for validation. Shouldn't we validate from the initial model in the ideal scenario? I think in the ideal scenario, if you had a true vendor-neutral uh, config model that covered all aspects of your network device configuration, then we wouldn't need Batfish to do that conversion step, right? So the reason we do that conversion step, the reason we build that vendor neutral model is there is no option out there today that has a completely vendor agnostic config model, right? You know, things like open config are attempts at that, but as we all know, open config is very incomplete. Uh, so our hope is over time, maybe people will, uh, look at the Batfish data model, which again, like Ritual said, it's all open source, so you can use that. And that could be uh, a source of a vendor agnostic config infrastructure, or open config will be more complete, and then we can start using that as well. The one quick thing I'd kind of want to add to that is I think if, uh, if somebody has network models, that basically is their network intent. 
So mm -hmm. one, one, one great thing to do, and we've seen some people do that, is um, to take those models and turn them into kind of their intent that Batfish validates. And then you're getting kind of this closed loop going, which is also checking for any errors in your config generation from those models. Uh, but there's a great deal of value in actually checking the config as it exists because that's what the box actually runs. So it's actually, in essence, checking for bugs that may show up anywhere upstream. The models could be wrong, the inputs to the model could be wrong, the template generation compilation could be wrong. But by checking the config, you're basically catching all of these things. But you could take a data from the earlier step in the pipeline and check it there whether, whether you got it right or not. That's certainly possible. Great, thanks. Um, here's a here's a question. Maybe maybe you can or can't answer it. Um, can you please explain, show a bit more about the L3 routing calculation, uh, validation and testing capabilities of Batfish uh, versus just firewall ACL analysis? Um, yeah, so I think uh, the first scenario actually actually both scenarios were checking everything uh, about the about the fabric. Um, when the firewall rule was checked, I think there was a micro check run on the firewall rules itself, but there was also checking with respect to essentially the base DC policy routing was also checked. So I don't know if the question relates to, do we check these in combination? Then the answer is yes. If the question is actually like how we do it, uh, that's a much longer discussion. And we have papers online on batfish.org. Uh, and of course the code is there, uh, but the two sentence description probably would be that uh, from the config, uh, we understand how these devices will behave given that config, and we turn that into uh, behavioral models, and those are the models that get validated. And we've got models for you know the management plane like NTP servers, DNS servers. We've got models for routing, uh, OSPF, BGP, ISIS, what you have, and we've got other types of models for ACLs, firewalls, and filters as well. In combination, we are basically want to model the path of a packet or a routing announcement in your network. Uh, and whatever whatever impacts it along the way, uh, basically we end up modeling that. And that's the model against which reachability and other things get checked. So, so do you actually, another follow-up here is, um, mm -hmm. do you, are you able to support MPLS traffic, um, traffic engineering modeling? Um, so I think it, um, the conceptually the answer is yes, uh, MPLS, TE, uh, especially auto bandwidth is not something we support today, uh, but we support things like tunnels of other forms and we support some of the other concepts are there. So conceptually, I think MPLS TE is not different, but it's just something we haven't focused on yet. Uh, but again, I think um, if there's a specific use case uh, at a network, we are happy to um, chat and, and see uh, what um, whether somebody else can add it or we can add it as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um... Uh, I think I think someone someone's been on your website. How is Minesweeper different from Batfish? Um, yeah, um, so I think uh, this is um, um, so Minesweeper and Batfish were for those who don't know were names given to kind of research prototypes that we were building along the way. Uh, Minesweeper kind of builds on Batfish and adds some of the capabilities um, like you know protection against uh, all possible route announcements or all possible failures, as an example. From a user standpoint right now, I think, or from a code standpoint, there's no difference. Uh, everything is essentially Batfish. We don't try to maintain that separately. I think when Minesweeper work got done, it got bundled into uh, Batfish itself, but its separate identity exists only so far as a separate paper with the specific techniques explored in that paper or written. Uh, so, but unless you are a researcher, uh, Minesweeper versus Batfish shouldn't matter to you as a user or developer. Right, and I guess that maybe that's also probably the same answer. I know there, I've gotten a few, a bunch of questions about the data modeling, uh, about what is it, Yang, is it open config, et cetera. To the user, that, that shouldn't matter, right? I guess if you're a developer, you probably would, but if you're a user, that probably wouldn't matter, correct? It, it, yeah, it really wouldn't matter. I think underneath the covers, um, and Samir alluded to this, what happens is the first thing we do is take the vendor config and turn it into our internal vendor neutral model. Uh, we happen to represent that in JSON. Uh, but that's just kind of internal to the tool itself. Yeah. Uh, but to, to the user, it probably wouldn't matter uh, unless you want to, you know, tinker with the model itself just as a developer or as a, as a researcher or some, some exploration. Okay. 
So do you have a, a website where you can see the full list of, of uh, supported platforms that your data model supports? Um, some people are asking about, you had talked about firewalls, so they're asking about, is it Checkpoint, is it Palo Alto, is it Fortinet, is it ASA? Do you, do you support all those? Um, where do you yeah. find that? So the, the GitHub repo uh, and the GitHub page has a lot of documentation on what's supported. So the quick answer, we support Palo Alto's, Juniper SRX's, and Cisco ASA's today for firewalls. And, you know, as always, we're happy to work with anybody that has other firewalls that they want to add in. And, you know, we welcome GitHub issues and PRs. So, uh, you know, the beauty of an open source project is we can sort of all contribute to that and, and improve it and sort of uh, expand coverage. I think I okay. see a couple other interesting questions. So uh, there's yeah, one that's one more. I, if you go ahead. We're going to do a couple more and then wrap it up. So if there's any there, we do have some. Go ahead. Uh, if you see some good ones. Yeah. So I think one good one that comes up is how is connectivity to external networks validated? Is there a way to input routes to a model? Example via a BGP session. That's a great question. So we focused on this demos on sort of the app just configs, but absolutely you can feed external eBGP data, route announcements, into Batfish. And then in its route computation, when it builds the route models, it will factor that in and allow you to validate how traffic can come into your network, how traffic is going to leave your network, what destinations outside of your network you can reach, et cetera. So we can fully incorporate external BGP route announcements into the overall validation. Um, there's a question around how do you compare against other modeling solutions um, Example for our networks. Um, the biggest difference, I think, between us and um, what Batfish does, and what um, I can speak more confidently about the research techniques behind where the company came out of, like aerospace analysis. So, we have the difference is that we are pre deployment uh, change validation. Uh, we can do some of post deployment as well, but I think we are pre deployment in the sense we can take your configs and actually produce the network behavior that will emerge without pushing configs to the network. Uh, uh, forward or header space analysis, they focus on um, essentially pulling the network state uh, from it and reasoning about it completely. So the difference in, in essence is what, do you, what is the input uh, based on which you build the model because that then uh, dictates what can and cannot be validated. So for us, the input is things like uh, configuration and routing announcements coming from outside and then we can pre-deployment produce the network behavior that will emerge. Uh, forward and header space analysis, uh, they will uh, take the input to the model is FIBS and other operational state from the network. So it works as an operational state analysis tool. And one of the beautiful things I think they do and us as well around like it's not just monitoring. You actually are building a, building a rich model from whatever your input is and then that gives you comprehensiveness. But the difference tends to be like whether or not can you do the extent to which you can have some pre-deployment checks going. Yeah, I mean I think just to add like the quick summary I would say is the big difference ends up being how are you computing the models? Are you computing the ribs and fibs from the configurations or are you building the models based on ribs and fibs that are feed, are provided to you by the network elements themselves? And that big distinction determines whether you can be pre-deployment or your post-deployment. So there are a few questions there we see, Andreas. You tell us uh, when you want to stop, otherwise we are happy to take them. Yeah, you go ahead. We'll probably take a couple more. I want to usually like leaving a, a little, a few minutes here at the end, but I know we've got a couple there. You feel free to, you can go ahead and answer which ones you love, you want. I'll, I'll cut you off in a couple minutes. All right. So I think we see a question on how are policies defined. That's a great question. So the way policies are built is you using our Python SDK, you write a series of checks, and then we turn that into policies. So you know the policies that I showed over there is we have a specific Batfish check that says, you know, make sure there are no undefined references. And then you, using that, you turn that into, a, you add that to your policy. So the policy is just a collection of these different checks that, you, that Batfish can do that you organize in a logical grouping. Uh, and all of that is done today through the Python SDK in the open source world. And then in sort of the closed source world, uh, we have a web UI that also aids you in policy creation. I think another one online is can Batfish verify checks in the format? Tell me who will talk to who. Um, so the, the answer is yes. Uh, so internally, I think what happens is we can, I, 
if I'm interpreting the question correctly, we can actually produce the full reachability matrix uh, of the network uh, from the source locations to ending locations and what packet headers uh, will, and that's what kind of like the model can essentially uh, produce. Okay, one more and then we're gonna wrap it up. You pick it. All right, so I'm just looking for something um, that is thematically different. Um, Um, yeah, so I think this one's kind of interesting uh, question, uh, which is, do we understand differences between vendors when it comes to protocols? Um, so the answer is, um, the answer is yes. I think our code essentially encodes what I think of as like, you know, the experience of an experienced network engineer around understanding vendor differences and what exact config lines mean. Um, and when we build the model, and also when we normalize the vendor config, I think those differences get accounted for in the way you might expect uh, those to be there. Okay, great. Appreciate that. So I think we're out of time. We've got some other questions. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone. Really apologize. Uh, feel free to get a hold of of, of Samir uh, offline uh, if you want to get your an your question answered. They'd be happy to get those taken care of. Um, one question that was asked is where do, can we get some of the uh, example playbooks and all that? We will make sure that we put links to, uh, we, we, can, we can provide this presentation, uh, the playbooks, links to the GitHub, all that stuff as part of the, um, when we actually post it to our webinars page. So don't worry, you're not gonna miss it. And once we actually post it, we'll send you an email. So with that, I really appreciate your time. Uh, and thanks again to uh, Ratul and Samir for taking the time out and, and showing us a little bit about Batfish and Ansible. And we will see you next time. Thank you again. Hey, thanks, Andreas. Thanks for hosting it. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh